also a five-year-old son. He's not here today. I loved every part of who he was. And I'm very saddened that I'll never get to watch him grow up. How did your son die? His death certificate says homicide. Lacey Spears is not an innocent mother grieving the death of her son. She is no longer the mother of Garnet Spears because she murdered him. You will not hear a single witness that saw Lacey Spears do anything, give anything, or feed anything to her son that would cause his death. to lose her child. Lacey Spears is a calculating child killer. You don't expect to take them to the hospital and never bring them home. Her research planned and executed the intentional poisoning of her son, Garnet Spears, with salt. I didn't hurt him. I never poisoned him with salt. I spent 26 years with the Decatur Police Department. Ten of those years were exclusively in the investigation of child abuse. I never saw a case that was so overtly Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Munchausen by proxy is faking illness in someone else and also inducing illness. It's usually a mother on behalf of a child. It's mostly to seek attention. I did not have Munchausen by proxy. I didn't harm him in any way. I seek help for him diligently because I was his advocate. We began to pull medical records. We were able to identify possibly 20 medical facilities from the time Garnet was born in 2008 to the time they left the area in 2010. There was indication that she was visiting different doctor's offices without sharing information from one doctor to the other. He just would not take a bottle of baby food and not gaining weight. And nobody could explain to me what was going on. This case had a lot of warning signs. The story is told in the records. What we're looking for is what is this mother telling us and does that fit with the picture that we see medically? For example, elevated salt. That's not medically explained. I am 100% convinced that Lacey Spears is directly responsible for the death of Garnet Spears. My son is not here today because someone in that hospital screwed up and neglected to take care of him. 27-year-old Lacey Spears, now convicted of killing her only child, Garnet Spears, as a last act in an ongoing bid for sympathy and attention, a pattern of salt poisoning that ultimately took the boy's life. She's now convicted of putting salt in a feeding tube the boy had since infancy. Doctors said it was no longer necessary, but provided her with a way to keep him sick. During deliberations, jurors seemed to be searching for an explanation. It was apparently only a matter of motive, not whether she did it, but why. One ultimate juror said hospital video left him cold. The way she came out of the bathroom, sat on the bed with him and just watched him, you know, I mean. You thought you were looking at a murderous there. Yeah. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Good evening. Today's episode, Munchausen by Proxy, the story of Lacey Spears. Now, Lacey Spears chronicled her son's demise on Facebook, posting updates and pictures as he suffered from an overdose of sodium. Whoa. Okay, we'll get to that. Overdose? We'll get to it. Let me just go. He had high sodium levels. Yes, he did. But we'll talk about why it was an overdose. Okay. As his condition deteriorated, Lacey posted photos of five-year-old Garnett on life support, asking for people's prayers. At the same time, police had been called in to investigate the circumstances of Garnett's death. Child Protective Services alerted police when a hospital physician found suspiciously high levels of sodium in Garnett's blood. What we now know is that the circumstances were a continuation of what Lacey Spears had done throughout her son's brief life. Using social media, 
to gain attention over his medical crises and her emotional ordeals as a single mother. She'd been getting away with it for years, but there was no possible explanation for the high sodium levels that killed Garnett Spears, except that salt had been deliberately introduced into his feeding tube by his own mother. So this was the behavior of a mother with Munchausen by proxy. There had been cases before in which a parent deliberately poisoned their child with salt. In 2010, a Tennessee woman was convicted of injecting salt water into her son's feeding tube. Police said that the woman was trying to gain attention and sympathy for herself. She was later diagnosed with Munchausen by proxy syndrome, or Munchausen syndrome by proxy. As we're going to discuss today, there were red flags surrounding Lacey Spears well before Garnett was killed, well before Garnett was born, in fact. Today's discussion will follow the life of Lacey Spears, which led to a short and pain-filled life for her son, Garnett Spears. This case is right up Dick's alley, as much of what we've learned includes childhood illnesses, though fictional and inflicted. So, because Garnett died in a New York hospital, we have a New York beer to share. But first, let me do a few five-star reviews. Okay. We got some? We do. We do, we do, we do. We have My People by Dixie Lulu. My bestie told me to listen after the first episode, and I'm hooked. Dick and Jill have a great podcast, and they talk facts. I love that they respect one another and make me feel like I'm right in the room with them. And I'm learning a lot about beer, too. Keep up the good work. You guys are my favorite. Oh, that's a nice one, isn't it? Yeah, Dixie Lulu. Welcome to the brewery. Come on in. Come on. Come on in and have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a southern name. Dixie Lulu? Yeah, a little well, bit. Sure. A little bit. I mean, at least the Dixie part. <laughs> yeah. And I guess the Lulu, too. Probably. And the next one I'm going to read is Such a Treat. And this is by Bossagog. I'm, I'm mutilating that, but it's, it's Bossagog is what I'm going to say. And Bossagog says, I absolutely love this podcast. I'm a true crime addict, and they cover such interesting cases with soothing and educated fluency. I'm always excited when their new episodes pop up on my phone. Keep up the great work. Salute. GG. Salute. Yep, so it says GG there, so I'm going to say, GG, welcome to the brewery. Yeah, it's tough to mangle GG. Right. So let's stick with that. Come on up and have a beer with us, GG. And I'm going to read one more because we've gotten behind and I want to get you caught can, up. So can I'm going to read, read three as many today. As you want. I'm just going to read three. I don't want to overdo it. My head gets big if I read too many. So the next one is Great Podcast by Lindsay Fantastico. I don't think that's her real name. Well, maybe Lindsay is. Maybe, but Fantastico. She's probably just a really fantastic Lindsay. Yeah. Not your ordinary run-of-the-mill Lindsay. No, this is a fantastic Lindsay. Right. And Lindsay says, these guys are great. If you're looking for a loud, abrasive couple, this isn't the podcast for you. What I love about these two is that they go over cases and share what their honest thoughts are. No bells and whistles. <laughs> and I actually really enjoy their calm demeanor, and it's perfect to listen to before bed. I could do without the full-fledged beer review, but that's only because I don't drink. But other than that, they have some outstanding recent cases, and their case on Darley R. was right on. Fascinating cases, entertaining dynamic between the two, and highly recommended. Way to go, you two. So, Lindsay Fantastico. Thank you, Lindsay. Welcome to and the brewery. You know what you can always do is fast forward through the beer review. Well, I'm sure she knows that. You don't have to listen to it, but even Dick's though they're got a brilliant. Nice voice. Even if you're not into what he's saying, Dick has a pretty soothing voice, especially if you're going to bed. That's right. It's a good sleep aid. He always talks me to sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> So that's it for my five-star reviews. Dickie, what do we have for our New York beer today? We have a beer from Brewery Amagong, and I think I've done another beer from them, a Game of Thrones beer or something like that for a long time ago. I remember that, yeah. But Amagong is in Cooperstown, New York, and they brew a phenomenal quadruple. Quadruple? Well, I call it like. quadruple. I don't know if that's correct. I don't know either. Okay. Let's just say quad. They, they brew a beautiful quad called Three Philosophers. So quads are Belgian ales of great strength and bolder flavors 
than their cousins, the doubles and the triples. They're typically dark with hues of red. They're full-bodied, richly malted, sweet, and noticeably alcoholic. Nice. Yeah, my kind of beer. <laughs> anyway, so Three Philosophers pours a nice dark brown with a uh, light, light tan coffee with cream colored head. Sort of like that. Okay. It's got a caramel and fruity aroma. The taste is coffee, chocolate, dried cherries, and coffee lingering on. This is a very warming and complex beer. Nice. It will stay with you for a while. So it's a, it's a good beer <laughs> to sip on a winter night. All right. That's what we need tonight. It's chilly. It is almost winter, right? It is. Let's open it. Okay. So let's take these bottles and glasses, because we got a couple bottles. They're only 12-ounce bottles. Yes. So we'll take them down to the quiet end. I'm noticing they're putting up Christmas decorations. They do that as soon as Thanksgiving's I mean, over. Thanksgiving boom, just died, right. and we're already into Christmas decorations. Of course, yes. But it is quiet, because people are still suffering the post-Thanksgiving hangovers and... <laughs> food hangovers. Sure. So there aren't too many people here. We can sit down and do our broadcast here. Yes, I think so. Let's go. All right. You grab the bottles, I'll grab the glasses. Okay. All one right. for you, one for me. Absolutely. Let's go, Dickie. Okay. So, growing up, Lacey Spears had an American Girl doll that she took with her everywhere. She loved Lifetime movies as she got older and she loved the syrupy sweet drama of her favorite TV show, Seventh Heaven, which was about a minister, his stay-at-home wife, and their seven children. But Lacey depicted a dark childhood to her friends. She told stories of anorexia, sexual abuse from relatives, and abortions. Many of her stories were unbelievable and easily proved to be false. Now, back in high school, some friends had planned an intervention to confront Lacey about her lies. They were just obvious and she wasn't getting it. And they really wanted to help her change her ways because they thought she had potential. But she would turn away from them and she'd just go and find new friends. So she wasn't open to that. Now when Lacey was in the ninth grade, she joined the Parkview Baptist Church softball team. Paula Sandlin, a 47-year-old mom, drove Lacey to and from the practices and the games. And soon Lacey started calling Paula mom, and that made Paula uncomfortable. Stranger than that were some of the stories that Lacey would tell her. Now one day Lacey showed up at the church with an ankle brace, and she told the team that she'd fallen while cheerleading. But then she also said that she fell because she felt weak because she hadn't been eating. She told people that she was anorexic. So I guess this would be the beginning of Munchausen's syndrome. Well, maybe in her, for sure. Yeah. But she was already at a fairly early age coming up with illnesses. That's Yeah, that's what I mean. So. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think the has, abortions and the anorexia, those are all. Yeah, and the sexual abuse. I sure. Mean, that, that was never investigated or proven. No, not at all. So, so there's there's lots of things going on with Lacey from a very early age. I think so, yeah. I think lots of things. Now, when Lacey claimed to have gone three days without eating, one of the girls said that she'd seen Lacey eating a hot dog the day before. But that didn't really faze her. She just said that was all she'd eaten in three days was the hot dog. Yeah. But what would have happened if someone else had come up and said, well, I saw you eating a hamburger two days ago, and she would have said, well, it was just that hamburger and that hot dog <laughs> in the past three days. She would have adapted her story. Yeah, she never seemed to admit that she lied ever. No. Mm-mm. Now, when Lacey was 14, she told friends that she was pregnant. Paula didn't believe her. Later, Lacey told Paula and others on the team that she'd gone to Birmingham's Caraway Methodist Medical Center to get an abortion. But when a friend challenged the story, because abortions weren't done at that hospital, Lacey said, oh yeah, I went to Florida. A teller of tall tales from early on. Yes. Now, Paula told investigators that Lacey had, that Lacey had a pattern of telling lie after lie, and if she didn't get the reaction she wanted from one lie, she'd just move on to a bigger one. Yeah, 
I mean, she would just not even acknowledge that the first lie was a lie. No. She'd just move right on. Right. Dr. Mark Sirkin, a clinical psychologist and Mercy College professor, notes that a woman whose self-esteem is underdeveloped may reach out for attention to compensate for that. Now, Lacey's heightened storytelling through the years is a clear sign of compensating for low self-esteem. So Sirkin said, We tell stories to ourselves. That's what a self is. It's the story you tell yourself. You can see her making efforts to tell her story and retell her story in increasingly functional ways for her, but dysfunctional and destructive in the long run. That's a very apt description, isn't it? I think so. So, before there was even a Garnet Spears, Jonathan Strain was in Lacey's life. Lacey watched Jonathan at daycare, and then she watched him on weekends. Jonathan's mother, Autumn Hunt, stopped letting Lacey babysit when she learned that Lacey was posting photos on MySpace of Lacey and Jonathan, claiming that she was Jonathan's mother. Now, Jonathan's chronic ear infections resolved shortly after he was taken out of Lacey's care. So, her behaviors with Garnett were in place before Garnett was even born. Right. But nobody's going to go back and investigate earlier claims or, or abuse claims. Well, nobody really looked at it until the unimaginable happened. Right. Now and, in, and then they figured out. Sure. Now, in high school, Lacey volunteered at the Parkview Baptist Church Nursery, and she took a special liking to a one-year-old boy named Charlie. Charlie's mother eventually complained, saying that Lacey made her nervous and she didn't want her caring for Charlie anymore. So after high school, Lacey started working at Kids Club Daycare. She moved out of her parents' house and moved into a, pi- a two-bedroom apartment with her older sister, Rebecca. Lacey loved her job. She was very dedicated. She opened the center at 5.30 a.m. and she closed it at 6 p.m. That summer, she went on several dates with Blake Robinson, a handsome young policeman from the Morgan County Sheriff's Office. They had three dates, but they never had sex, according to Robinson, because he was a strict Southern Baptist. And we all know that that means no sex before marriage. Right. And that October, she enrolled in nursing classes at Calhoun Community College, where she met a young single mother in one of her classes named Christy Burnham. So Christy, she was a single mother of a 10-month-old named Cameron. So we can see trouble coming right there. (laughs) Well, yeah, I I can see that she's going to be taking care of Cameron. Right. Eventually she's going to be claiming that Cameron's her child. Probably. And that she's such a great caretaker for him. Yeah. And does he have chronic ear infections also? Uh, I believe he ends up that way. Lacey was driving Christy to and from classes when she met the baby, and soon she would loan Christy her car to go see her boyfriend, and she would stay home with Cameron. For no cost, no charge, she would babysit for free so Christy could go away. Yeah, and I'm sure Christy looked at this as what a great deal. Sure. I got a wonderful, dedicated babysitter. I think a lot of people saw Lacey that way in the beginning. Yeah. But she did become obsessed with Cameron. She bought him diapers, she bought him a car seat, she bought him a crib, and she never asked for any payment for her babysitting or for the baby supplies. So she'd babysit Cameron at any opportunity, even asking to babysit him. And also when she took Cameron out in public, she'd tell people that he was her son. Uh huh. <laughs> so now she's had at least three kids we know of that she's watched. Yeah. And each one of those she's claimed was her child. And I wonder, is there any significant that these, any significance that these are boys or is that just a coincidence? No, that's, I think that's coincidental. Okay. Because I thought maybe she had more of a thing for the boys. No, I think if they'd been female, she would have done the same thing. Okay. So she never asked for any payment for her babysitting. And um, when Lacey took Cameron out in public, she told people, he's my son. And one day, when Christy was out with her son, someone asked, Hey, are you watching Lacey's baby? (laughs) (laughs) That must have come as a shock to the real mother. (laughs) Yeah, hey, that's Cameron. That's Lacey's baby. Yeah. And Christy said, No, that's my baby, and thought, Well, this is really weird. Mm Mm-hmm. So during the six months that Lacey babysat for Cameron, he began to get the chronic ear infections. 
He was frequently at the doctor's office and frequently on antibiotics. So one Saturday morning in the spring of 2007, Lacey took Cameron for a weekend visit. So this is where the straw that breaks the camel's back happens. When she was due to return with Cameron on Sunday, she didn't show up with him. Whoa. And Christy didn't find her son until sometime Monday when she tracked down Lacey and said, you return Cameron right now. What was the excuse? I don't think there was one. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Can you imagine what that lady is going through? I know. Now, when Christy told Lacey that she couldn't care for Cameron anymore, she said, that's it. She said that Lacey broke down in tears and begged her to let her see the little boy again. So that's really bizarre. It is. In late I, I wouldn't let her anywhere near my kid. Yeah. After that. I mean, that's... No, that's scary. There's... And we don't there's know where she was with him. Little things, there's big things. This is a big thing. I mean, she didn't bring him back when she was supposed to bring him back. Yeah. And Strange. no word. And couldn't get a hold of her. Uh, boy, I'm not letting her watch that kid ever again. Well, that's what Christy said. So in late 2007, Shauna Lynch began bringing her 18-month-old son, McKelly, and his older brother, Zach, to the kids' club daycare. Shauna and Lacey became friends, and then one day... Lacey asked if she could take McKelly home overnight with her. Now that right there is weird. It is. I yeah. mean, it's kind of out of the blue. Yeah. I mean, I know she's watching him at the daycare, but... Why would you want to take him home? Yeah. So Shauna agreed because she trusted Lacey. And when she took the boy to Lacey's apartment, she said it looked like a daycare in Lacey's apartment. There was safety equipment and toys... You know, bassinets, walkers, all the baby stuff was in there, like it was a daycare. This is a young girl's apartment. Right. Uh, maybe I'm speaking as a guy or something, but that would just creep the hell out of me. It's very bizarre. I don't think it's it, just as a guy. That's strange. Yeah, I mean, she's a, what is she, 20? Yeah, 20-ish. Ish? Well, I don't so know. So she yeah. should have a, an apartment that's decorated more for her age and not... To attract young kids, right? Yeah, well, why would you have all that baby equipment? Oh, Weird. Oh, God. Yeah. But then, McKelly began to get ear infections while in Lacey's care. And according to McKelly's grandmother, his ears were really gross. They leaked pus and blood. They'd have to put uh, washcloths under his head. So we have now, I know she's watched like four kids or so. Yeah. But three of the four have had chronic ear infections yeah. under her care. So my, now might be a good time if you want to just tell us a little bit about ear infections and wh how weird that is. Well, it's all in retrospect. Sure. But, I mean, most kids with ear infections have colds because right. they're secondary infections. So you have an upper respiratory infection, which little kids get all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Whether they're in daycare or not in daycare, they always get colds. And you get a cold and you can develop an ear infection. Right. But most of the time, it's just an infection. You look in and you see a bulging red eardrum and you say that's an ear infection and you take care of it. It's far less common to have chronically draining ears. Yeah. And that's what all these kids had. Yeah, they did. Now, it's, this is looking retrospectively. Sure. But, yeah. I mean, most, the majority of ear infections are just red hot eardrums and not draining ears. And yeah. not, not both ears draining. Cause I think most of these kids or the three of these kids had bilateral ear drainage. Well, that's what I was reading is it's very unusual to have both ears yeah. at the same time. For, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So in retrospect. Sure. I'm thinking that she was inducing ear infections in these kids. Yeah, any and it idea sounds what horrible. you think she did? Yeah. What do you think she did? I think she stuck needles in the ear. Oh, God. Or some object to puncture the eardrum oh my God. to introduce infection and get the drainage. They did have perforated eardrums, yeah. Well, that's that's how it happens. Yeah, I mean... It had to hurt, though. The perforation? Yeah. Yeah, but then once it perforates and you got drainage, it doesn't hurt anymore. Oh, God. But still, I mean, you see the pus coming out and, yeah. and blood. So the typically, if it's a, just a regular ear infection, it does perforate. You just have pus. Right. 
it's rare to have bloody drainage. Yeah. So I'd be suspicious if I'm the physician with bilateral bloody draining ears that something's going on. Yeah, and we'll get more into that when we talk about the ENT visits. So when the Kids Club daycare closed down, Lacey got a job at Child Care Network. And she also babysat in her small apartment on her evenings and weekends. So this guy, Chris Hill, he was a garage door installer. He was 23, and he lived in Lacey's apartment building. And one night, Lacey went to Hill's apartment. She asked him to help her assemble a new bassinet she'd bought for, I think it was John John that she was babysitting. And he came over to fix it, and one thing led to another, and they had sex. Oh, God. Oh, God. Big mistake. So according to Hill, he started a kind of a relationship, a weird relationship with Lacey, where he would make her dinner, and they'd watch movies in his apartment. He said they had sex fairly often, but she would never spend the night with him. And he says, I know I was an idiot, but the subject of contraception was never even brought up. Well, yeah, he's an idiot. Yeah, he is. He is. He admits he's an idiot. That, he said he drank a lot in those days as well. So, if, if you're sleeping with a woman that you're not married to, sure, the primary concern is safe sex. Right. 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 So, wear a condom. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Well, he was an idiot, but I think that Lacey was probably trying to get pregnant which most yeah, and, women wouldn't and, be. And who knows what the conversation was. I mean, maybe sure. she said, oh, I'm on a, the pill or something. I don't, know. I don't know. He said it never came up. Never came up. He admitted to so, that. Yeah. So he just plowed right in. <laughs> maybe that's sure. not I don't know if the that's the vernacular, but yeah. So Lisi adored babies, obviously. And uh, the weird thing to Chris Hill was that he had a five-year-old with another woman and when his five-year-old son visited, he said that Lacey just ignored the kid like he wasn't even there. But I love kids. Mm -hmm. Right. She loved babies. Oh, babies. So five-year-olds don't count. They're no. They're not babies no. anymore. And then a couple times he asked her, and she refused mm -hmm. to babysit his five-year-old. She wouldn't watch him for him. No. No. The woman who loves kids. Right. So, of course, Lacey became pregnant. <laughs> and she asked Chris Hill if he'd like to get married and have a family. And the smartest thing he ever said was no. No, he didn't say no. According to him, he said, sure, I don't want to have another child out of wedlock. Let's try it. Whoa. So Lacey introduced... Surprise. Yeah. So Lacey introduced Chris to, the fa to her family, but then suddenly Lacey told Chris, you're not the father, and she told him that her old boyfriend, Blake, was the father. So Blake was the policeman that said he never had sex with her. Yeah, and, and I have it on pretty good authority Yeah, that you have to have sex to become a father. Okay, that's something you learned in college. I learned that. Okay. So if he never had sex with her, he probably isn't the father of the child. Right, and we'll hear a lot about Blake later on in this discussion. Oh, for that's, sure we he will. He becomes a big topic. Yeah. But she told it, Chris Hill anyway that she didn't want to see him anymore. <laughs> So Chris didn't believe that. He felt that Lacey had used him to get pregnant because she just wanted a child, but she didn't want a man in her life. And then Lacey went around telling people that Blake was the father of her baby. So this was very dysfunctional. <laughs> that even doesn't begin to describe it. No. So Garnett Paul Thompson Spears. He was born on Wednesday, December 3rd at Huntsville Hospital, he weighed 6 pounds, 14 ounces, and he was a healthy baby. Within minutes of his birth, Lacey was posting pictures of him on MySpace. So her first post was, Labored only four hours, and my blessing was here. Another post was, He's all mine. Which, looking back, is kind of a creepy <laughs> phrase. It's kind of foreboding there, isn't it? It is, yeah. So her friends Sean and some other Shauna and some other friends came to visit Lacey and her baby in the hospital. But when they went to the nursery to see Garnett, there were no babies named Spears there. But later, Lacey told them that she'd registered under an alias in case Chris Hill had come to see his son. So <laughs> God, that's weird. Yeah. So during the first week of Garnett's life, 
She posted dozens of pictures of herself posing with Garnett, and he was discharged from the hospital on December 5th. So that was the Friday, two days after his birth. He was discharged, no health problems, healthy baby. Yeah, and for a full-term baby that's not delivered by cesarean section, yeah. that's the time they discharge, two days. Two days, right. So I, I would assume that so there weren't any was normal. complications, everything was normal. Right. And that's not what she would tell people later on. Right. She'd tell people different stories. And that Sunday, two days later, Lacey brought her four-day-old baby to the emergency room. She was claiming that he had a fever, he had jaundice, and he was pulling at his ears. Okay. Any comments? Let's, let's address those. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Pulling on his ears a four-day-old isn't going to do. Right. <laughs> Unquestionably. Sure. Um, fever in a four-day-old could be a potential... That's taken seriously. ...big thing. So you're going to work that up. So that baby probably had a... Lumbar puncture, possibly. I mean, blood work for sure. I mean, if if they and what was the other thing? Jaundice. Jaundice. Four day olds, are, they're all jaundiced. Yeah. To some degree. Right. Some more than others, but the the big thing is fever. Fever in a four day old is a huge red flag, and you're going to do a workup to evaluate for possible infections. So at the very least, you're going to do. Uh, some blood tests and a culture of the blood and a urine and a urine culture. And very often you'll do a lumbar puncture, uh, which is a spinal tap, and investigate the spinal fluid. So some pain could have been inflicted on him at four days old in order to do this workup. Well, yeah. Yeah. Spinal taps aren't much fun. No, no, those aren't. Even drawing blood on a baby could be a lot of pain. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if they can't get a vein quickly... Right. It can be an ordeal. Sure. But Garnett was examined that day, and he was found to be healthy and sent home. Yeah, and I, I wonder if he was even febrile when he went to the ER. Oh, I doubt it. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, you know, you say, oh, he, I took his temp and it's 101 or something like that, and he shows up in the ER. Right. And it's normal, and he's not been medicated for fever. So... He was examined and sent home, and at that time she was still babysitting the one-year-old Jonathan Strain. This was before she'd been tossed out as a babysitter of Jonathan. So she posted these really weird pictures of them both on MySpace. She posed Jonathan holding Garnett in his arms, and she captioned it, Big bro and little bro. He loves him so much. Ooh. Yeah. And in one series of photos, she posed them in matching outfits. She actually took them to the park in matching outfits, and they were playing together. I don't know how an infant plays. I mean, the baby was too young to be playing. But she had them posed in the park, calling them brothers, and she actually took a selfie of her and the two boys, and she titled that selfie, Me and My Babies. This is a sick lady. Absolutely, I mean, it's, absolutely. It's easy to say in retrospect, but God, she she has problems. I think a lot of people in her life knew she wasn't right way before, though, don't you think? Way before the crime and the horrible things happened. Yes, no yeah. question. So he was born on December 3rd, and the day after Christmas, Lacey brought Garnett back to the emergency room, so he would have been three weeks-ish. Right. Yeah. Third to the 25th, a little over three weeks. Yep. So she complained that he was sick again, and she posted pictures of him in the hospital wearing a t-shirt with an IV in his arm. And she wrote by those pictures, poor baby boy, um, see his IV, <laughs> and my entire world, and he is my life. Now... But she didn't talk about why he was ho he was hospitalized? He was in the ER, and he had an IV. And he had an IV. Yep. And this is like at three weeks of three age, weeks so old. we're still thinking that he could be infection. So they might have given him antibiotics, right? Right, which probably weren't necessary. No, no. So in early January of two thousand nine, Lacey started bringing Garnett to uh, Decatur General Hospital or the Southern Rural Health Care Clinic almost daily. She complained that he wasn't eating enough, he was vomiting, and that he had bleeding from his ears. How unusual is that? In a one-month-old? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, 
doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Okay. I mean, it, it just, you, you don't see that. So pediatrician Melissa Young King treated Garnet at the clinic on numerous occasions. She never saw him vomit, and she really couldn't determine the cause of these chronic ear infections. On January 13th, Dr. Young King actually wrote in Garnett's medical record that she suspected Lacey Spears might suffer from Munchausen by proxy. Well, good. Did she report this? I don't know. I don't think at this point it was reported, but it did get reported. She was concerned that the infant might be a victim of the induced Ill- of induced illnesses, and she also found it odd that Lacey was so well-versed in medical terminology and infant illness. Yeah. So it was years later that medical records from the Alabama Department of Public Health would reveal how concerned doctors were. So there was a record. There had been reports made. And they were very concerned about Lacey's mental state. That's good. Did they report it to authorities? I mean, did they... Well, the Alabama Department of Public Health. Good. Yeah. And they investigated? Um, I don't know. Okay. Any investigations that happened obviously fell by the wayside. Yeah. Or the tragedy wouldn't have occurred. Right. So it was presumed that Lacey suffered from postpartum depression at that point and Munchausen by proxy in the first weeks of Garnet's life. Well, and if you're thinking that, at least, not, not so much for the depression, postpartum depression, but if, if you're talking about Munchausen by proxy, and we'll talk more of this later. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and tell us about Munchausen by proxy? I know you have some research there. Oh, and this is going to take a, good a while. Time. Go ahead. I've, I've got the time. <laughs> All right. You got the time. I got the beer. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> you ready for this? Sure. Munchausen by proxy comes from Munchausen syndrome, comes from Baron Munchausen. So, Baron Munchausen is a fictional nobleman created by a German writer named Rudolf Erich Raspe in 1785. He wrote a book called Baron Munchausen's Narrative of his Marvelous Travels and Campaigns in Russia. Well, that's a little weird. 1785. Okay. So the character Baron Munchausen is loosely based on a real baron, Hieronymus Karl Friedrich Freiherr von Munchausen. This real-life Munchausen fought for the Russian Empire in the Rus- Russo-Turkish War of 1735 to 1740 or so. Upon retiring in 1760, he became a minor celebrity in German aristocratic circles for telling outrageous tales based on his military career. Oh, I see. Right, I'm so starting you, to see here. What so you got this about. guy who was building himself up to something he wasn't. Sounds familiar. So the fictional Baron's exploits, which were narrated in the first person, focused on his impossible achievements as a sportsman, soldier, and traveler. For instance, he rode on a cannonball. On a cannonball? A cannonball. He wrestled a 40-foot crocodile. Uh-huh. And he traveled to the moon. Wow. In the 1700s. Pretty good, huh? Pretty good. So, in 1951, Dr. Asher described a psychiatric disorder called Munchausen syndrome. This is a factitious disorder wherein those affected feign illness, disease, or psychological trauma to draw attention, sympathy, or reassurance to themselves. Okay. Okay. So, factitious. Factitious. What does that mean, factitious? Made up. So, that's the same as fictitious. Right. Okay. I'm just not familiar with that. The affected person exaggerates or creates symptoms of illness in themselves. Yep. So what's the difference between that and someone who has... um... Hypochondria? Yes, thank you. In hypochondria, the person believes these are real illnesses. Oh, okay. In Munchausen's, they're They're fabricated to achieve secondary gains. Sure. Like attention and sympathy and so on. And they might even induce actual illness. They might. Okay. So this begat Munchausen by proxy. Here's another one. So we've, we're going down the line here. We've gone from the Baron Munchausen, who told tall tales, right, to Munchausen, who tells tall tales, to yeah. Munchausen by proxy, right, who also tells tall tales, but in another person, right. So this is where an adult does things to a child that ensures the child will experience 
some medical affliction, compelling the child to suffer through treatments and hospital stays. Okay. So they're making up illnesses in the child. Right. This was first described in 1976, 77. There's some disagreement on when it was first described. Uh Uh-huh. Because 51 was when Dr. Asher described it in Munchausen syndrome. Right, So the proxy syndrome was 25 years later or more. Okay. So there's different people who did it. But in 1977, a British pediatrician named Roy Meadow gave the definitive description of Munchausen by proxy. Okay. So there we are. So that's the stuff. Yeah. So what about this idea about the Internet making this whole thing blow up and increasing Munchausen by proxy because people can get so much more attention? What do you think of that? I would definitely agree that you can get more attention through the Internet. Right. right, right, sure. And more sympathy, because I, I think that's one of the big things in Munchausen by proxy, that you're portrayed as this courageous person, and they're my, mainly women, by the way. Well, yeah, yeah. But you're this, this person who is courageously dealing with all these adversities and struggling to make sure your child does well. Right. And you're looking out for the best things for your child. Right. So... You put things up on the internet, and you're going to get lots of responses. Yeah, that, at least they had a lot of followers. They just feed into that. Yeah, and they would feed into it. That's what yeah. I was talking about, is I think they would, you know, bring her even farther. She's like, oh, well, I could get more attention with this and this, and all these right. pictures she would post. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's easy in hindsight, but she's looking for... Validation. Or, yeah. That's the word. <laughs> okay. Right. Validation. She, she's looking for validation right. of the afflictions that her son's having. Right, right. And she gets all this secondary gain from posting it on Internet websites. Right. Social media, basically. Right. Now, Lacey verbalized on January 14th of 2009 that she wanted to harm Garnet. And she was referred to medical social services. So this was part of the postpartum depression. And Lacey was interviewed by an investigator for the Alabama Department of Public Health, Parents and Children Together, Parent Assistant Agency. So over the next few months, the social worker actually tried to visit Lacey's home numerous times to inspect it. She made appointments, but Lacey was never home and never returned her calls. And the investigation just kind of fell by the wayside, basically, from what we can tell. No records of them actually following up. And so, during the third week of January, Lacey brought Garnett back to Huntsville Hospital, complaining that he was projectile vomiting and not gaining weight. Lacey told people that Garnett had a surgical procedure, and apparently the Huntsville staff hadn't been informed of the Decatur Hospital or Southern Rural Clinic's concerns where she'd taken him before. But that's a hallmark of the syndrome. Sure. I mean, you're seeking medical care from a wide array of practices. Right, and they don't know about each other. And they don't know about each other. Right. I mean, it's easier now with more and more people being on electronic medical records that you can get past histories, but... Yeah, but a lot of them don't share between facilities. Right. Right. They don't. No. And, I mean, you you have to take the mother's word. Right. That this is what's going on. You you don't have any idea. She says, oh, I've been to different hospitals. Or she doesn't say that she's been to different hospitals. Right. Right. Yeah. But even though they didn't know about these other hospital visits, they still put Garnet in a room without his mother for 24 hours, so... It seems like they were immediately suspicious. She wasn't good at hiding this. No. So that's what really blows me away that she got away with it because she wasn't very good at it. No, she certainly wasn't. No. So on January 22nd, Lacey posted a series of pictures of Garnet, and she said he was recovering from surgery. So below these pictures she wrote, um, at Hunt's Hospital for Surgery. Now we could find no record that he had had surgery during that hospital stay. And none, then none, none whatsoever. Couldn't find any. So and then in February she began she was seen screaming at 
garnet in a Walmart parking lot. And a witness became so concerned. So February, he's like two months old. How do you scream at a two-month-old? <laughs> right? That's very bizarre. You don't. I mean, unless you're month having old. problems. I mean... Well, unless you're mentally ill. Two-month-olds. <laughs> they don't do anything. They don't really. do anything to piss you off. They cry, maybe. But anyway, she was heard screaming at him in a Walmart parking lot, and a witness became so concerned that she reported that to the Alabama Department of Human Resources. And then it was only three days later that Garnet underwent a Nissen Fundo placation procedure. So Lacey had taken Garnet to the Huntsville Pediatric Gastroenterologist, Dr. Randall McClellan. And now, he... how did she arrive there? Someone must have referred her there. Well, maybe the maybe the ER did the Huntsville Hospital. Well, where she'd some, taken somebody it. had to. You just don't call up the GI people and say I need an appointment. Right. You get referred. Yeah. Well, this gastroenterologist diagnosed the nine-week-old Garnet with failure to thrive in reflux disease, and at his request, pediatric surgeon Dr. James Gilbert performed the radical surgery. Now I know there's a lot of stuff that happens before that, so go ahead and tell us. You know, if a, if a kid's having reflux and vomiting, you don't go ahead and do the surgery. Well, not first line. I mean, well, that's what I'm saying. The, the majority of kids that are newborns spit, and some of them spit a lot. And we always divide this into happy spitters uh, that are thriving and crabby spitters who may or may not be thriving. So happy spitters that grow, you know, you don't worry about them. You might try some symptomatic treatments in terms of positioning with feedings or thickening feedings, stuff like that. But the babies that are fussy, you worry that they're having reflux and inflammation of the esophagus and kind of having heartburn. So that's one thing. Okay. Now, if, if you have that, you're going to intervene. Right. And so he must have had weight loss in order for anything to be done. No, not no? so fast, my friend. Okay. He let's let's start at the beginning here. So let's say he, by history, was spitting and fussy. So the first thing you're going to try is acid blockers. So medication. Medication. Sure. And then if that's not working, you consider other avenues. So now, you're going to try positioning, and then you might try medication. Right. So she had been through other things before this happened. Yeah. I mean, when you read the book, it seems like they went right to that. but. And that if that's not effective, you consider other things to do. I think the, the only reason that they did the surgery that they did, and I'll talk about that, is because this kid was a severe failure to thrive. Which means he lost weight, right? He, he was losing weight, and I think they were kind of forced into it because... From what I read, he was below birth weight at nine weeks of age. So he was born I mean, at this, 614. This is serious. He went down to like four pounds. Yeah, this is... So she was starving him. Well, as it turns out, that's probably what was happening. But sure. But the, the people, the, the physicians didn't know that. So they're looking at this kid whose mother says he's vomiting every feeding, and he's at nine weeks of age, two pounds or more under birth weight. Right. So they're going to be more That's aggressive. That's very serious. That's extremely serious. Right. So they did the fundoplication. Okay, tell us about that surgery. And this is not benign surgery to do on a nine-week-old. So it's a procedure to treat gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is what they thought the baby had, and it's usually used when medical treatment has failed. So I'm not sure. I didn't read anything or hear anything what medical treatment was done, but... That's right, but I'm assuming they must have but tried then, other things. Yeah, and any physician, sure, whether it's a gastroenterologist or a pediatrician, is going to do the simple things first. Yeah, because this surgery is a big deal. It is a big deal. They, they take the upper part of the stomach, which is called the fundus, and they wrap it around the lower end of the esophagus and stitch it in place. So what this does, it reinforces the closing action of the muscle at the bottom of the esophagus, and it prevents reflux or vomiting. So food goes down and stays in the stomach. But there's no way to bring it up. Right. Yeah. yeah. So okay. you've solved the problem. And I guess they were thinking that if we do this, he'll be able to eat without vomiting and he'll thrive. 
Now, do they do this with the thought that they'll reverse it at some point? Wait, yeah. So what happens when he's a teenager and he drinks a pint of Patron or something and he needs to vomit <laughs> it? Seriously. Yeah. No, you you can't vomit with this. Right. Because the, the stomach's wrapped around. I mean, you're creating a barrier. Right, which can be dangerous. But, yeah, I you would intend to reverse it at some point because you don't need to do it anymore. Right, right. So let's get this kid growing. Pretty much everybody outgrows reflexes in newborn. Right. Um, the muscle at the bottom of the esophagus gets better at working, and uh, you, you just outgrow it. But this is a big surgery. I mean, they opened up his abdomen. Well, no. Most no. of the time it's done under laparoscopy procedures, so you put a probe in and you do it that way. So right. it's But he was under general anesthesia he, he at that age, which under is under general anesthesia a big deal. for sure. Sure. It's a, it's a big deal. Yeah. It's not not benign surgery. No. So it wasn't very long after the operation that Lacey came back with Garnet to the Southern Rural Health Care Clinic, complaining that he wouldn't take his formula. And there he was seen by a Dr. Adrian Schuler. See, now already she's not back to where they did the surgery. No, she went to another place. She went Well, she went to a place she'd been to before. Right, back to the clinic. But she wasn't going back to the people who did the surgery. No. And that's... It's a red <laughs> flag, isn't it? It is. I mean, and the, and the people at the Southern Community Clinic should have referred her right back to them. Right, to and the I think surgeons. a lot of places would do that. Yeah. But they didn't do it. So she said um, that he refused to take formula, and he did refuse to take the bottle of formula that she had brought with her. So because he wouldn't take the bottle, the doctor sent Garnet to the Decatur General Hospital and had them put in a nasal feeding tube, which they just slide through the nasal passages, so it's not a surgery. Right. But after the procedure was done, Lacey was posting on her MySpace page Pictures of Garnet with the feeding tube, asking for more prayers and help, you know. This is what we're going through. Yes. So on February 11th, Lacey brought Garnet back to Decatur General Hospital, complaining that he was refusing formula again. And a nurse finally um, succeeded in feeding Garnet the formula that that Lacey had brought with her. But after the baby drank that formula, he became very lethargic. So when the doctor asked Lacey about it, Lacey told the doctor that it was improper formula. And I have no idea what that means. (laughs) But I guess it was accepted. But they did do blood tests. And the blood test showed that his blood sodium level was critically high at 180. And then he started having seizures and he stopped breathing. He was intubated and he was airlifted to Children's Alabama Hospital in Birmingham. How old was he then? Well, this is February 11th. So he's what, two months? Two months. He's young. And do you want to take this time to talk about sodium levels? Because 180 is outrageous. 180 is. Yes. This this is after he had the fundoplication. Yes, which means if he took it, he wouldn't be able to vomit it up. Right. Right. So, But it's not too long after it. I mean, he had the fundoplication at nine weeks or so of age. Nine weeks, and here he's like... And this is... This is like 10 weeks. 10 this weeks. Is shortly after. And it's already he's had his surgery. She's been to the uh, clinic. Right. Complaining. And she's back to Decatur General because he's not eating. Yeah. And... And now we've got this some outrageous blood work sodium they're level. They're transfer him to a more tertiary care center for specialized care. Right. And they, they have a sodium level of 180. Yeah. What's a normal sodium level? So... Sodium is an electrolyte, right? Right. And we all have that in our blood. Sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarbonate. Those are the things that keep our blood balanced between acids and bases. And uh, normal sodium level in a kid is between 135 and 145. So like 140 is a normal sodium level. Okay. So... If I'm looking at a kid with a sodium of 180, I'm thinking, what the fuck is going on? It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Right. Not not medically. Right. There certainly are things that can cause your sodium to increase. Right. But it's not going to get to 180. No, I mean, if it was 150. 150, even 160. 
You'd be worried. I'm looking at a kid who might be dehydrated or whatever, but 180, that's all sorts of red flags. Huge. Huge, I, I believe that, yeah. So Lacey flew to Children's Hospital with her son, and by the, by the time they arrived at the Children's ICU, his sodium had dropped to 165. Still critically high, right? Still critically high, but believably high. Okay. So, believably high if he was severely dehydrated. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and there's some other things. Maybe he had diabetes, insipidus. I mean, there's, there's things that will elevate. But your... nothing that he really had. No. So, he was treated with IV fluids to hydrate him and bring his sodium down slowly. S and... Yeah, you have to do it slowly. That's, that's the key thing, because if you try to correct it too quickly, you're going to induce brain swelling, and that's not good. Right. I'm wondering, did the did the hospital that received him think that the 180 value for sodium was an error? Initially, yes. Okay. So the doctor told Lacey that Garnet had been diagnosed with hypernatremia, which is high blood sodium, and his treatment would um, carefully lower his sodium levels with replacement fluids of dextrose and one half normal saline. Right. So, but you you do a correct that sodium level slowly, like I said. Right. And this is over 24 to 48 hours. You, you can't do it quickly because you're going to run into problems. So they're going to very slowly correct the and sodium. You don't want to give them too much fluid. You don't want to that give could be disastrous. Too much fluid. And you don't want to drop the sodium too quickly. Right. Because that can be disastrous. So you have to look for a slow, steady decline of sodium. So Garnet's condition improved, and he was extubated, so he could breathe on his own. And as he lay critically ill, Lacey chronicled his brush with death on her MySpace page, complete with pictures. And the pictures were captioned, I don't feel good, Mommy. And Garnet was transferred from the ICU to the general pediatric floor, and he remained there for 11 days. A gastrointestinal specialist was assigned to do feeding evaluations on Garnet to find out why he was having so many problems putting on weight. And although Lacey maintained that she was having trouble getting Garnet to eat, the doctor didn't have any problems. So during this um, two-day stay and the two-day evaluation, there were no problems getting Garnet to eat. Yeah, he ate eagerly. Yes. So they also did a series of tests to see why his sodium levels had increased. He was given an MRI and a CAT scan, as well as an upper GI exam to determine if there was any genetic or metabolic reason for his failure to thrive, and all of those tests were negative. So the Children's Alabama Hospital staff were very concerned that Garnet's feeding problems had something to do with his mother, and they actually quarantined him from her for four days and hospital nurses did all of his feedings, and he ate normally with no problems. Their observations conflicted with Lacey's reports that he would refuse feedings. And the doctor, of course, asked Lacey how she'd been feeding Garnet, and so she told the doctor that she'd been feeding him breast milk diluted with Pedialyte and oral electrolyte to prevent dehydration. So half-strength formula with Pedialyte and um, one part breast milk to two parts water. So she said that she'd been doing this on the advice of a doctor, but the doctor didn't believe her. He said no physician would advise feeding breast milk or formula diluted to that extent because <laughs> it would cause electrolyte abnormalities and malnutrition. Well, it certainly would. <laughs> I mean, breast milk obviously is the perfect food for a newborn. And formula is second to that. I mean, whether you feed them breast milk or formula, they're, they're going to supply all the calories the baby needs. So there's, there's absolutely no reason to dilute them. And if you do dilute them, the only abnormality that's going to occur, besides not gaining weight, is your sodium level is going to be low, not high. So, so that, that doesn't explain it That at just all. flies in the face of the explanation for how his sodium got so high. And she was clearly lying to that doctor, saying that she'd been advised to do that. Absolutely. Because that wouldn't happen. No no physician 
Well, what if he was sick to his stomach? No doctor would say, hey, no. give him two-thirds Pedialyte. No. Okay. If he's sick to his stomach and vomiting, you might give a short trial of Pedialyte, which is an electrolyte solution, as you mentioned. Right. And then you get them back on a formula or breast milk as quickly as possible. And actually, breast milk would be, if, if you're breastfeeding, would be the, the fluid of choice rather than Pedialyte. But I'm not okay. sure she ever breastfed this kid. No, there's no proof that she did. So. Now that spring, Lacey repeatedly brought Garnet to the Southern Rural Health Care Clinic. And Dr. Schuler thought that Lacey was genuine but overwhelmed. But she did become so concerned that she contacted the Alabama Department of Public Health about his severe chronic ear infections. And nurse practitioner Judy Collier also treated Garnet for feeding issues and ear infections, and she was suspicious that Lacey was causing injury to Garnet's ears because they just never cleared up with treatment. So on March 31st, Dr. Copeland, an ENT, an ear, nose, and throat specialist, examined Garnet's ears and found bloody drainage and perforations in both ears. So on April 6th, he did perform surgery on the perforations, and he referred Garnet to Dr. Alice Morgan for a second opinion, and that was five weeks later, and the infections had persisted. So So how old is he now? Well, April, he was born in December, so he's about four months old. Four or five months. It's a lot of trouble for a four-month-old. Very unusual. Very. I mean, to, to have chronically draining ears... Yeah. At that age is distinctly abnormal. Perforations in both ears. Yeah. So, and I'm going to assume that they investigated whether he had some kind of immune deficiency causing the problem. But it's still really unusual to have that degree of ear problems at such a young age. Well, and that doctor was suspicious. Good. So this doctor sent for sent him for a second opinion because it's five weeks after the perforation surgeries, and he's still having infections. And now, so, when you say perforation sur- they did surgery on him? Yeah. So they did tubes? Well, what else would they do? It would be tubes, wouldn't it? it You're not going to just sew it shut. No, you can't, can't do, do that. that. You have right. to do a tympanoplasty mm-hmm. to do that. So he was sent to this doctor at four months of age for chronically draining ears. And they put tubes in. And the the tubes are to equalize pressures so you don't build up fluid and infection in the middle ear. So the tube keeps the infections away. And usually that works. Although four months is a pretty damn young age. A lot has happened in these four months. No kidding. So before the baby got there, Dr. Copeland sent records to Dr. Morgan. And one report actually stated that Lacey might have Munchausen by proxy. So Dr. Morgan examined Garnet and found bilateral ear infections as well as a large perforation in his right eardrum. So she noted that there was fresh blood in the ear canal. So this was very suspicious because Dr. Copeland had written in his note that there was fresh blood in the ear canal on his exam. So why would there be fresh blood weeks apart? Well, we've talked about that because she's sticking something in his ear to cause trauma to it. And the doctors are suspicious, or at least this Dr. Uh, Morgan is. Yeah. Yeah. Rightfully so. So in June, so he's six months old, Lacey took Garnet to Decatur General Hospital for persistent vomiting. And Lacey said he threw up everything that she gave him. So nurses tried to teach Lacey how to feed Garnet to prevent vomiting. Just remember, he couldn't vomit because he'd had that surgery. Right. But she's telling the nurses that he's vomiting everything he gets. So So she she must not have told him the history of the fundoplication surgery. She did not. But all you got to do is look at him and see that he's had some abdominal surgery. There's scars. I don't know what she told them about that. Okay. But they weren't believing her anyway because when they fed him, he never vomited. And then it was on June 20th that she brought Garnet back to Decatur Hospital. And he was so ill that he was flown back to Children's Hospital in Birmingham. This is, you know, being flown to another hospital just doesn't happen unless you're like at death's door, right? You're you're critically ill, that's for sure. So a nurse in Decatur named Ginger 
Ginger Debs Anderson befriended Lacey, and she said she did this in order to keep an eye on Garnet. So she'd babysit Garnet, and she told police that he ate all sorts of foods at her house without a problem. She also recalled an incident where she witnessed Lacey forcing Garnet's head under cold bath water when he was fidgety in the tub. But Ginger didn't report her to the authorities. She didn't think that was her place at that point. Oh, God. I know. So many chances. So when Garnet was nine months old, Lacey thought, well, he should have a gastric feeding tube. Now, experts on Munchausen by proxy say this is just the worst thing ever because you're just giving them a portal to disaster. Potentially, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So she repeatedly asked the decatur... They, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. They didn't know she was a Munchausen by proxy at that point. Well, no, but it's very suspicious. Yeah, but she's... look into it at all. She's shopping around for doctors and clinics and hospitals, and she's managed to escape detection pretty much. She has, because she repeatedly asked these Decatur General Hospital doctors to do the surgery. She claimed to them that he went days without eating, but they refused, you know, and they said that he didn't need it. So she went from hospital to hospital, like you said, requesting this procedure. And eventually a doctor... Albert Shaw at Children's Hospital of Alabama performed the surgery after diagnosing Garnet with failure to thrive due to inadequate oral intake. Now, I would think before you do that surgery, you would admit that kid for a week with the mother not near him and make sure things are for real here. Well, that's just shitty. I don't get it. That's Holy shit. The, the basic evaluation is you don't take things at face value. So, but I think a lot of them believe the mother. Why would a mother ad, lie, right? Well, yeah. But, yeah. you know, admit them, observe them, and decide what you need to do. Yeah. So he had a, a G-tube. Do you want to talk a little bit about yeah. um, just, what's involved in that? What is a G-tube for well, people who don't know? It's a pretty simple operation, actually. It's far simpler than the fundal placation he underwent when he was a nine-week-old or so. Right. So a G-tube is a tube inserted into the stomach through a small abdominal incision. So it's right through the belly. So it's right through the belly into the ab into the stomach, and there's a tube and a balloon to anchor it in place, and there's a, a button type of thing on the abdominal surface where you can put a, some tubing or and inject stuff into the stomach. So within minutes of Garnet... I'm, I'm just astounded that somebody would do this surgery. I know. I know. And it's just... Ah. It's, such, it's such a tragedy. So within minutes of Garnet coming out of this surgery with his new gastric tube, Lacey was posting some post-op pictures of Garnet on MySpace. So some of the captions were, I don't feel good, mummy, and my belly hurts. From that time forward, Lacey had visual proof of Garnet's severe gastrointestinal problems to show to people, and she would also be able to feed him anything she wanted, which is the really scary part. That is the really scary now, part. Now, before she had to get him to eat things, but if he wouldn't eat them. But now she can put anything she wants in there. Yeah. Access to his stomach. Well, and that's just, I mean, it's one thing. I mean, the fundoplication, I think, is a pretty radical amount of surgery. I anyway, believe so, too. But I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that the kid was a severe failure to thrive, and they needed to do something. So I can see that. But the, the G-tube, the gastrostomy tube, I just don't have any clue why somebody would put that in. I mean, usually kids who are really sick have those, not normal kids. Right. They have other problems. They're right. neurologically impaired. Yeah. Or there's a danger of aspiration if they swallow. I mean, there's a host of things that would indicate the need for a G-tube. So a lot of kids have eating problems. They don't end up with G-tubes. Not at all. So it was in September of 2009 that Lacey opened a Twitter account under the tagline, At Garnett's Mommy. She tweeted, Please pray for my little prince. He has had another bad ear infection. Smiley face. Poor baby boy. So several days later, she's on Facebook, and she's writing, I'm so thankful to be a mommy. He is my life. I love you, Garnet Paul. So by the time Garnet was a year old, Lacey was talking about having another baby. She wanted to give Garnet a little brother. So on Halloween, she dressed up Garnet as a turtle, and they went to a children's party. 
But then, nine or ten days later, November 9th, she was asking people to pray for Garnett. And two days later, she told people that Garnett was in the hospital, and she said this is his 23rd hospitalization. At nine months of age. Yeah, nine or ten months. Huh. But again, I mean, if you don't know the whole history, this, this is easy for us to say. Yeah. Because we're looking back on things. But right. if, you, if you don't know it at the time it's occurring, it's, it's but tough. But don't you think, let's just pause a minute here. Don't you think it's creepy for any parent to be posting pictures of their sick child in a hospital bed with tubes and stuff? That's not normal. It's, it's beyond creepy. But So this is the whole thing I'm talking about. With Nobody nobody looks at that. I mean, the, the Child Protective Services and the physicians aren't looking at MySpace and Facebook or whatever it was. That's Twitter. a good point, yeah. So they don't know what's going on. Yeah, this. if everybody had communicated, they would have known. So on New Year's Eve now, so he's a little over a year, Lacey was posting about plans for fun with Garnet and her sister. But by January 3rd, she was posting about Garnet's illness again. So she posted, hoping for a night without seizures, high fevers and trips to the hospital. After a frustrating year of trying to treat Garnet's ear infections, the local ear, nose, and throat specialist had totally run, of, run out of ideas with this. So Garnett was referred to a specialist in Nashville, Tennessee. So early February now, Lacey drove 150 miles to see this specialist. And when he examined Garnett, he was, it was a completely normal exam. And he prescribed antibiotics and a nasal steroid for the ear infections. And then three weeks later, she drove him all the way back there and she claimed that he had severe earaches. And then while she's in the waiting room of that doctor's office, she takes out her new iPhone 4 and starts posting pictures of him on Facebook. Now Garnet's left ear was healed, but his right ear had a fresh prefer perforation. So this doctor thought it was suspicious and decided, I'm not putting ear tubes in, because that's what she was looking for, is some more ear tubes. Right. But on Facebook... But she, she claimed he'd had like nine sets of tubes in his lifetime. I mean, that's not real, is it? No. No. I mean, occasionally more than one. One or two, but... Right. Yeah. Never more than three. No. So on Facebook, Lacey posted that Garnet had gone to surgery, so the doctor said he wasn't doing surgery, okay? But in the meantime, she's posting on Facebook that he's having surgery... And then he had complications, and he was in the PICU, the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit. Even though he never had the surgery. Right. So several days later, she's still posting that Garnett is hospitalized. So she posted that Garnett had a 103-degree temperature with bleeding ears and eyes. And when a few of her Facebook friends questioned these stories, she just lashed out and unfriended them. Yeah. That's how you do it. <laughs> Friends at Lacey's apartment complex noticed that Lacey and her sister were taking Garnett to various churches to get assistance with food and clothing and baby items. And they called this um, church hopping. So Lacey told some church members that Garnett had had open heart surgery. One time Lacey claimed that she had lost a child, and she actually presented a fake death certificate for a child that she'd lost. So she also claimed that Garnet was born missing some abdominal muscles. She claimed that he had uh, cochlear implants and that he'd contracted a methicillin-resistant staph infection. And she said that he couldn't hear, but he could read lips already. So the, the lies are just outrageous. But, you know, she doesn't tell the same lie to the same people, right? No. So she can get away with it. A lot, but sometimes these people meet up and they know. Yeah, a lot of people but, know or question. But not know enough. Not enough, no. So in July 2010, so he's about 18 months there? Yeah. Yeah. So Lacey took Garnet to Clearwater, Florida to live with her grandmother. So a neighbor there became friends with Lacey, and Lacey told her all about Garnet's health problems. Although he seemed like a totally healthy kid to the neighbors. So Lacey confided in the neighbor that she was continually raped by relatives in Alabama, and that one of them was Garnet's father. A new story. Yeah. So a few weeks later, Lacey told the neighbor that she was pregnant by this abusive family member, 
and the neighbor actually made her an appointment for an abortion. She was just couldn't believe it. She was very upset. Oh my God, I'm going to help you get an abortion. And when the neighbor arrived to pick Lacey up for the appointment, she said Lacey was all casual and said, oh no, I lost the baby. I don't need the abortion. <laughs> yeah. More hindsight. Sure. So in February of 2011, Lacey bought health care insurance for Garnet, who had previously been on Medicaid. Then she started bringing him to health care providers for a variety of issues. So he was seen by a pediatric gastroenterologist, a pediatric ear, nose, and throat specialist, and a new primary care physician. And this is when she started to join these various attachment parenting groups. Attachment parenting teaches that children develop strong emotional bonds with their parents during childhood that last a lifetime, and that's their primary focus. So they had these mother's circles meetings, and all the mothers there would breastfeed their babies except for Lacey. So this was really surprising because Lacey had told everyone there that she breastfed Garnet and used a breast pump every three hours. But during these meetings, she, they'd never seen her breastfeed him. So it's questionable whether she ever breastfed him at all. Although she did claim to breastfeed him until he was five years old. Right. She claimed she breastfed him up until his death. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So Lacey got into holistic, holistic medicine at that point and special diets that would heal Garnet. And at one point, she had him on a grain-free, gluten-free, sugar-free, raw diet. And she claimed to give Garnet her herbs and health foods through his G-tube. So that's all she said she put through there. But then all of a sudden, she said she didn't believe in doctors or antibiotics. And she did have ear tubes put in Garnet's ears, but she refused to ear use the um, eardrops that were prescribed by that doctor. And then in June, the Florida Department of Children and Families began investigating Lacey for inadequate supervision of Garnet after they received an anonymous call. Now, the caller alleged that Garnet was abused, and Lacey was interviewed by a social worker. She claimed to be in contact with Garnet's doctors on a regular basis and that Garnet had never been abused. And a few weeks later, a report from the Florida Department of Children and Families listed claims that Lacey would slap Garnet for no reason and that she may have been injuring his ears, but the claims were found to be third-hand claims, and then the complaint and the investigation was dropped. Well, yeah, but I mean, I'd be suspicious if I've got a kid who has these chronically draining ears that's bloody drainage. Sure. And he's had how many sets of tubes? Ah. It's really a mess. Yeah. It is a mess. Now... So we're going to talk about Lacey's Facebook accounts. She had three, which were done at various times. They weren't all entered at one time. So one was called Garrett's, one was called Garnet's Journey, one was called Lacey Spears 16, and the other was Lacey Spears 33. Each account had different privacy settings, allowing Lacey to control exactly who saw what she was posting. Very clever, right? Yep. So over the years, there would be numerous postings about Garnet's father, Blake, that Lacey's family would never see. Lacey's new profile for Garrett's Journey spawned a blog called Garrett's Journey, Garnet's, Garnet's. Garnet's Journey, and its first post was entitled, Mommy, Where Is My Daddy? Isn't that cute? This is, no, it's just weird. It's awful. The blog told the tale of Garnet's ear and G-tube infections and Lacey's trials in raising her child alone. Lacey became a nanny for a young professional woman she met at an attachment parenting meeting. Yikes. <laughs> this might not end well. Yeah, right. Later, this woman would tell police how Lacey claimed to have a brain tumor and Crohn's disease. And after she confided in Lacey that she had, had celiac disease, Lacey claimed to develop that also. Yeah. So Crohn's and celiac. Well, that's what she said Garnett had as well. Right. And you know what the likelihood of having both of those? No. About zero. And do they ever diagnose it that young? In a child? In the baby, yeah. It's very unlikely. Crohn's is going to show up later. I mean, celiac can show up earlier. But the, I mean, you can do blood tests that suggest that the only way to definitively diagnose it is by a biopsy of the intestine. Which they did do eventually, yeah. 
right? Yeah. And which showed that there was no evidence of celiac disease. But we're jumping ahead. Now, one of the other women in Lacey's attachment parenting group offered her husband to Lacey for sex so Lacey could give Garnet a sibling. I that was nice of her. That's really generous of her. Very. <laughs> she, she must not have a very high opinion of her husband. So Lacey accepted. I mean, this is just fucking ridiculous. <laughs> I, I heard that and I started laughing. I said, this can't be true. It is Here, true. Fuck my husband. He'll, he'll make a baby for you. God. This kind of stuff happens. <laughs> it can't happen. It's, it's fiction. <laughs> okay. I don't want to laugh because this is a serious it, subject. It is, but I just... But that's horrible. I, I couldn't believe that. <laughs> you, you told me that and I said, I can't, I can't imagine that's true. And then I listened to it and I said, holy shit. So then I told my girlfriend, never mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's not into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Lacey accepted this offer and she did begin sleeping with the friend's husband. And... <laughs> I bet that ended well. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So things turned bad when the friend got jealous. Who would have thought that would happen? And they, they did try a threesome, but the friendship broke up soon afterward. <laughs> At least we have some comedy in, in this horrific tale. Yeah. So Lacey did not become pregnant. That's the one blessing in this whole shenanigans, this whole... I guess for sure it is. Right. So in January of 2012, Lacey uh, bought a, a Datsun for Garnet. So neighbors complained that Lacey would leave the dog in the garage in the heat. So they're in Florida. And they'd hear the dog whining and barking in the garage. So Lacey, at this time, was continuing to blog about Garnet's uh, bilateral ear infection, saying that she treated them with a mixture of breast milk and herbs. So that'll do it, right? Yeah, that'll work every time. Yeah. So she now claimed that he also had a spinal disorder, which was being treated by a chiropractor, and a doctor of oriental medicine. Right. So things are getting more outlandish. She's embracing non-traditional medical care. This is what she's doing now, yeah. Which I don't know if she's fully embracing it, but she's putting forth an image of someone who's embracing it. Right. Yeah. So in March of 2012, Lacey decided to kill off Garnett's fictional father, Blake. So she posted on her Garnett's Journey Facebook page, which didn't have any of her family members as friends, that Blake, a policeman, was killed in a tragic car crash in the line of duty. So now she could portray herself as a grieving widow who was bravely raising her son on her own. Again. Ideal. More secondary gain. She gets all this extra sympathy. She does. Not only is she a single mom, but she's raising this sick kid by herself. So Easter of that year, uh, Lacey's Lacey Spears 16 and Lacey Spears 33 Facebook accounts were very upbeat with pictures and tales of a fun holiday with Garnet, but the Garnet's Journey account told a totally different story. So That's on interesting. the yeah, so totally different stories on the different Facebook pages because there's different people. On the Garnet's Journey page, it said bittersweet Easter weekend. First, without Daddy Blake, family or friends, Garnet struggled to find out why Daddy wasn't here. And I struggled with his absence equally. So she could write well. Yes. She could write I'll get rid some of that. good stuff. Now, uh, she probably I'm, should have gone into writing romance novels and would have been successful. She could have. Mm -hmm. I'm just not that much of a Facebook person. But if she has three different accounts and she can control who who's, looks on, them. At, who's sure. on them. Right. But what if I look at one and see something and I... Check to see if there's other accounts or anything. Can I do that? I don't think so, because you have to be. She has to friend you to okay. see that account. So there's no way. But if there's any kind of different people can look at different accounts. Well, if there's any kind of overlap, which I bet there was some, someone could forward a post from one account, and people in other accounts could see it. Yeah. So I bet a few people did so catch on to this. Okay. Yeah. That's all I'm wondering. It doesn't sound like you could keep it a secret. Not totally, but she did have it pretty well worked out. So Lacey posted a photo of Blake on the page. It showed a broodingly handsome, dark-haired young man in a t-shirt and jeans. Facebook. What do you mean, broodingly handsome? Oh, who's, like a James Dean kind of thing. Is that your wordage? That's my wordage. Broodingly handsome, kind of like James Dean. Oh, please. You're reading too many romance novels yourself. <laughs> 
So Facebook friends who didn't know Lacey were gushing about it, so they fell for it. So back in Decatur, though, April Chambers, who attended school with Lacey, was suspicious, and she did a Google image search and discovered that it was a stock photo on a photo agency's website. (laughs) So Lacey began communicating with people on a survivor's website about her lost husband, and she gave a long, detailed, inconsistent story to several people. She claimed to have lost a child one year before Garnet was born, and she told them that Garnet spent the first two years of his life in the hospital. She said that a doctor of oriental medicine had saved Garnet's life through diet and herbs. So her postings brought a flood of praise and well wishes. So this is the thing about social media feeding into it that I don't like. Well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's always plenty of people that are going to empathize with you and agree with you. Well, I guess that's true. Well, so. <laughs> Yeah. For sure. But it just, it was a negative thing. It made, it kind of fed into her. Well, yeah. And it, made her do more or it was encouraged an encouragement. her. So in May of 2012, Garnet had to have his two front baby teeth removed after he fell in the kitchen and one tooth had been pushed into the gums. And the following day, Lacey reported on Facebook that Garnet had osteomyelitis of his upper jawbone. She wrote how much she missed her soulmate Blake and how she felt unbearably alone. Now, was he hospitalized for I mean... No, he went to the... Osteomyelitis is a serious disease. It's well, sure. It's an infection of the bone. But he didn't really have that. I know, okay. but she said he did. Yes, she did. And, I mean, he should have been hospitalized with IV antibiotics for that. Sure, but he wasn't. Because it never happened. Right. So, meanwhile, on her Lacey Spears 16 account, she bragged of how much breast milk she'd pumped. So she's saying how miserable and alone she is on one, and then on the other one she's saying, wow, I pumped 30 ounces of breast milk. And then she talked about how she donated breast milk for these premature infants and yada, yada, yada. Uh, You know, I won't even go into it. So in June, she wrote that she and Garnet celebrated Father's Day in a local park, and she posted a closely cropped version of the photo of Blake, you know, the stock photo of the guy. And beside that, she posted a photo of Garnet at the park. Now, after a friend told Lacey about Waldorf schools, so Waldorf schools were established in 1919 by a philosopher, Rudolf Steiner, and Waldorf schools integrate holistic values with the academic development of their pupils. So Lacey embraced that. So she latched on to this. Yes. So there are 150... So this this is something she heard from a friend, and she thought, oh, I love this. Yeah. And she's going to move to go to a Waldorf school. Yeah, there were 150 in North America. So she researched these schools and decided, hey, this will be the perfect lifestyle for me and Garnett. So she learned that in exchange for working in this community, she could get free room and board and a free education for Garnet. So she applied to the fellowship in New York State, and her application was absolutely filled with lies. She said she had hospital experience, a nursing background, an interest and experience in caring for the elderly. And it took three months, but Garnet and Lacey moved to Chestnut Ridge in New York, where Lacey was hired to work, and Garnet would attend the Waldorf School. But before the move, Garnet's puppy was found dead under a neighbor's window. The dachshund? Yeah. Oh. I know it. I love dachshunds. I know you do. So Lacey told some people that the puppy had drowned in the bathtub, and she told other people that he'd eaten a poisonous frog. (laughs) So I'm thinking she killed that puppy. That'd be a horrible thing. I know, but it is believable. Yeah, I mean, what's a puppy? Right, to her. So a few weeks after the puppy died, Lacey told Facebook friends that Garnet had a red blood cell disorder. She posted on Garnet's Journey blog, a month-by-month photographic essay of her and Garnet's life since Blake's passing. So she described the 14-hour drive back to Alabama that she'd taken in March for Blake's memorial service. And before her move to New York, she didn't tell her friends of her plans to move, and she canceled some doctor's appointments. And her Blake postings had begun to talk about her supportive in-laws and the gifts that they gave her and Garnet. 
So not only is she talking about this deceased spouse, but she's talking about these great in-laws that she has. None of which is true. Right. And on her 25th birthday, she wrote about her heartache that Blake wasn't there to celebrate with her. So Lacey and Garnet moved into this fellowship in New York in November, and after more anonymous complaints about her parenting, she'd been contacted by social workers and appointments were made but not kept. And then she went ahead and left Florida and went ahead and moved to New York. I'd just like to take a minute to remind everyone about our Amazon link, tiegrabber.com forward slash Amazon. I know that many of you will be doing holiday shopping online, and for no additional cost to you, you can support True Crime Brewery by doing your shopping through our link. So that's tiegrabber.com forward slash Amazon. Also, I wanted to remind you that we love to get your five-star reviews on iTunes and we'd like to read them on the air. So your reviews also can help us find new listeners. So if you have a minute to do that, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So now here comes the phase where she's living in this fellowship. What kind of gives her this more isolation where she can well, seem yeah. to get away with more? I mean, you're, you're in a closed community here. And on the one hand, you, you don't have much publicity about things. But you're in a, in a small community, so everybody knows your business, too. That's true. So she has to be, on the one hand happier that she's in this, but more cautious that she doesn't tell the same lies to different people. Same lies to different people. Or different, different lies different to the, lies same, to the people. same people. Okay. How about that? That's better. Okay. <laughs> so this, this fellowship had a 33-acre farm. Yeah, they had cows, horses, um, organic farming. Right. Quite a place. Several houses and outbuildings, including a community dining room. Lacey wore a diamond engagement ring and told everyone she'd lost her husband in an auto accident. Garnet was very outgoing and well-loved. The fellowship had a general practitioner who saw Garnet and referred him to a local pediatrician for his ear infections. Good. Good for him. <laughs> yeah. Lacey told the people at the fellowship about Garnet's health problems, but he seemed healthy and ate well in the dining room. Okay, and she initially had a housemate. Her roommate at the fellowship returned from a trip. Lacey was wearing some of this person's clothes, and her quilt was on Lacey's bed. Yeah. Red flags. Yeah, so she was stealing her stuff. She would tell police later that she came home once to find Lacey leaning over Garnett with a tube sticking out of his ear. Yeah, this was an interesting story. Later that day, Garnett seemed down and when asked what was wrong he said his ear hurt yeah so that's that's a suspicious thing yeah but you know again in retrospect she was inducing these infections in the ears so i'm, I'm sure his ear hurt and he's at the age where he's going to start noticing that mommy's doing things to him which is a problem for Lacey. well yeah because right? you can't have your kids saying mommy's hurting me right so the housemate did complain to the executives at the fellowship and she also complained that she could hear Garnet crying and Lacey screaming at him at night while she's giving him his bath. So Lacey's bathroom was up against this lady's bedroom wall, and she could hear Garnet crying at night, Mommy, that doesn't feel good, and Lacey yelling at him to shut up. So she went and told the executives about this, and they actually called her a troublemaker, according to her, and said, you know, just leave her alone. She's just a nice mom taking care of her kid. So when the executives called her a troublemaker, she eventually ended up moving out because she couldn't live there. Because she just felt like they were giving Lacey the benefit of the doubt over everything. So they, they chose to believe Lacey and not this woman. And there were other incidents, yes, where she claimed that she claimed once that a man was coming on to her there and him and his wife had to leave. There were a few things. Yeah. 
I mean, yes. it wasn't just an isolated incident. No, no, no. She no, was no. constantly complaining about people harassing her, or sexually propositioning her. Right. So when Garnet's pediatrician asked Lacey for Garnet's medical history, she told him that Garnet had aspirated at birth and had been transferred to the NICU, the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit. By the time Garnet was two months old, Lacey said, his weight had dropped to four pounds. Now Lacey never had Garnet's records forwarded, though, to the new pediatrician in New York. When he had his exam, he was normal height and weight for his age. He seemed like a normal child. Yeah, the pictures we see of him in TV shows, 20, 20, or 48 hours, whatever it was. I mean, he looks like a nice, robust, average five-year-old. Doesn't look like anything wrong. His front teeth are still missing. Makes it extra sad, though, doesn't it? Yeah. So Lacey drove Garnet to Middletown, New York, for an appointment with a pediatric gastroenterologist, Ivan Durkinoff. So before his exam... Lacey filled in this doctor on Garnet's extensive history. She said he had celiac and Crohn's disease. Doctor and, and again, I just want to remind people, those are two different diseases that don't usually coexist. And I'm sure Dr. Durankoff knew that. <laughs> I bet he did. Now, he urged Lacey to get a feeding evaluation to see how many nutrients Garnet was taking by mouth and through his G-tube. He told her on each visit to get this evaluation because he didn't want Garnett to have the feeding tube if he didn't need it. Right. But she never followed through with that. I mean, you, feeding tubes induce all sorts of problems, primarily infection. But that the, was part the, of what he said. Also, the site can break down. There's a host of things that can go wrong with feeding tubes. So if you don't absolutely need it, get rid of it. Sure. So Dr. Durankoff performed a gastrointestinal endoscopy on Garnet. And the procedure confirmed that Garnet did not have celiac disease, although in the future she would continue to say that he did. Right. And he, it was an upper GI endoscopy, so he couldn't make a diagnosis one way or the other of Crohn's disease because you need to go lower. Oh, okay. And that would be more invasive? Well, that would involve probably more of a uh, rectal endoscopy. Okay, well, then he urged her again to get a feeding evaluation because his thought is this kid's normal, right? Right. So on Tuesday, January 7, 2014, Garnet returned from Christmas vacation, and he attended school, and he seemed fine. But on Friday, Lacey kept Garnet home from school. So just after 8 a.m., Lacey wrote on Facebook that Garnet was really struggling, and that afternoon she took Garnet to the doctor. So she was complaining that he couldn't cope in school, that he couldn't concentrate, and that he had night terrors. She also told this community doctor that he wasn't eating and had to be tube fed. And she told teachers he had a temperature of 104 and a stomach virus. So on Sunday morning, Lacey posted a photo of Garnet smiling and eating Chinese food. At 3.45 p.m. on Sunday, she posted more pictures of Garnet, happily painting a picture at the kitchen table. But just after 6 p.m., Lacey emailed the teacher that he would be going to the doctor the next day to have his sodium levels checked, which is a weird thing to say. Well, yeah. I yeah, mean, <laughs> that doesn't it's, happen. It's more than weird. You, you don't take your kid to a doctor to have the sodium level checked. No. And you take the kid because he's sick or has something going on. And she actually said to the teacher in this email, the slightest change in his sodium levels caused him to have seizures. Please. So there's a huge red flag. It is. But we're going to find out she was researching stuff anyway. Right, right. So she she made three Google searches on her iPhone looking for her old boyfriend, Blake Robinson. Then she checked the number of days from October 6, 2011, which was the day she said Blake was killed, until the present. Then on Monday, she looked for normal sodium levels for a child and sodium blood ratios. Yeah. So... I mean, I guess it goes back to where she said when he was an infant he had a sodium of 200. Yeah. Which is... Not possible, Not is possible. No. Inexplicable. But she's focused on sodium. So then a few hours later she brought him back to the doctor. I think that's the pediatrician, right? Or is that the one on the compound? The GP? Compound? <laughs> I think the pediatrician. She said Garnet had been running a fever for the previous five days as high as 105. The doctor took his temperature then, which was normal. So There's a red flag? Red flag. 
His exam showed him to be well with no signs of infection. And later that night, Lacey made Google searches about the effects of elevated sodium levels in children, sodium chloride. She made eight separate searches. Later on, she arrived in the Good Samaritan Hospital emergency room because Garnett was having problems. They arrived at this emergency room at around 11.30 at night. And while they're in the waiting room, Lacey took several photos of Garnet, and she told the nurse that Garnet had had two seizures, he was retching, and he seemed to have a headache. And then she told the ER doctors about Garnet's medical history. She said that Garnet had been hospitalized for high sodium when he was an infant. So they did blood work, and Garnet's sodium level was slightly elevated at 147. But this was in a level that would require treatment, right? Right. And Garnet Plus, was sent home. I would also add... If she had uh, elevated sodium at how many weeks of age? When he was an infant, nine months or something? Yeah. Several months. And then suddenly at age five or almost five. Yeah. Again, those don't go together. I mean, if you have some in inborn error or some metabolic problem, you're going to have continual elevations of sodium. Sure. So you, you can't. Which they'd already ruled that out. Right. And you yeah. can't just show up four years apart and say, well, it happened before, it's happening again. Yeah. Got to be some suspicion there. So she was told, you know, take him home and return if he has any more seizure activity. Sure. So that Thursday, she took him to his pediatrician and she told him that she'd gone to Good Samaritan ER Tuesday night and that he'd had five seizures. So she's kind of embellishing there. So the pediatrician examined Garnet and found nothing wrong with him. And at 1.20 p.m. on Friday... A friend checked in on Lacey and Garnet, and Garnet was uh, whimpering and holding his head when she came over. So this friend was a nurse, and she told Lacey, you need to get Garnet to the hospital. So at 2 p.m., after Lacey had given Garnet a tube feeding of whitish liquid, she borrowed a car, and she took Garnet to the Nyack Hospital emergency room. And on the way to the hospital, she actually pulled over the car and took a photo of Garnet in his car seat and posted it on Facebook. So she took the time to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's, at two twenty p.m., her behavior is so bizarre; it's unbelievable. Then she texted friends that they were on the way to the hospital, and she actually texted to one friend, "What if he dies?" Well, what if? Yeah, I mean, she's so inappropriate here. She's such a sick person. Yeah. So she told the triage nurse at the hospital that Garnet had had three seizures. Now his vital signs were normal, but the nurse said his hands were really shaky. And he was examined by the ER doctor at 3.30 p.m. that day. So after telling the doctor about Garnett's surgeries and his G-tube, she told him that he had been hospitalized as an infant for a high sodium level. She told him that Garnett's sodium level had been about 200, which the doctor didn't believe because that level, he said, was incompatible with life. Well, it is. <laughs> You cannot have a sodium at 200. You get brain swelling and brain death. So Garnet was admitted for observation. And around 4 p.m., the ER doctor gave report to Dr. Sumku, who would be the admitting physician. He warned Dr. Sumku that he didn't believe Garnet was having seizures. He said that he thought the mother might have Munchausen by proxy. And then when Lacey met Dr. Sumku, she told the doctor that Garnet had celiac and Crohn's disease. So here she goes back to that. Right, but this doctor is a neurologist, so they're going yeah. to determine whether he's having seizures or not. Yeah, he's going to get the full workup. So they're going to do a video electroencephalogram. So this involves not only doing electrodes on the scalp to record brain activity, but you're videotaping it at the same time. To see what the, what the kid's doing at the right. time. So, Do you think uh, they had any idea there to keep an eye on the mom with that video, too? Maybe. Because they were already suspicious that she had Munchausen by proxy. So that could have been part of it. It could have been. Mm -hmm. But they wanted to try to define... I mean, the, I mean, the main thing is if the electroencephalogram is showing seizure activity and he's not having a seizure on video or vice versa that he's having a seizure and his EEG is normal, that's a help. So I can see where they'd want to do both the EEG and the video. And maybe they were suspicious of her. They were. 
I think there's I mean, enough, they said they were. enough sus- stuff going on that she... Well, this whole saying a sodium level of 200 right there is suspicious. So they set this up, and he did some blood work at the beginning of the procedure, and everything was normal, including the sodium levels. So around 7 p.m., this is about two hours into the, the procedure, Lacey has to, a friend to come over and sit with Garrett. Garnet. Keep calling him Garrett. Well, because Garnet's an unusual name. Yeah. Garrett's more right. common. So she could run home and get things because they would be in the hospital for the weekend. She's going for about an hour. She got back in at uh, 10, 20, 10 or 10, 30. She updated her Facebook friends, which... To me, is strange. When That's we her priority. About this. Her priority yeah. is to keep her fussy. She's, she's got a sick kid, but she's going to text. Over the next 40 minutes or so, she searched Google 44 times for children's EEG activity levels. Well, at that point, I'm thinking, is she suspicious of why they're videotaping her? But then I thought, if that was the case, she wouldn't have done what she does later. No. I mean, if, if she Weird. was, she wouldn't have killed him. So I think she's just looking for... Figuring out how she can game the EEG to make it look like he's having seizures. Oh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, you might be right. So, uh, the next day, Saturday morning, Garnett's nurse, Nora, arrived for the day and introduced herself. An hour or so later, Lacey posted a picture of Garnett with the EEG mu- machine on Facebook. Of course. So, look at my son. On the afternoon of that day... Mm-hmm. The neurologist examined the Garnet. Lacey told the neurologist that Garnet had had a sodium level of 200 as an infant. <laughs> this is the third person she's told on right. the submission, yeah. He, he didn't believe her because that's not compatible with life. Can't have a sodium at 200 and survive. So on Sunday morning, Garnet seemed happy and healthy, and at 9.08 a.m., Lacey made some Google searches of iodized salt and the nervous system. Now, at 10.25 a.m., the video EEG showed Lacey taking Garnet into the bathroom. He looked happy, even grabbing a cookie on the way into the bathroom. And Lacey came out of the bathroom and returned to the bathroom with a cup and Garnet's G-tube connector tube. And when Garnet returned from the bathroom, she carried him in. He looked very lethargic. And then Lacey went back into the bathroom and returned 50 seconds later with the cup and the tube. And there was a blank look on her face, really weird. As she climbed into the bed, she checked to make sure that the G-tube button was closed on Garnet's belly. And she just sat there and watched Garnet. Then she picked up the nurse call button and sat it on the bed like so it was ready. And then suddenly Garnet keeled over and he was retching trying to vomit, but of course he couldn't vomit. And at 10.35 a.m., Lacey pressed the nurse call button. So the nurse came in and saw Garnet rolling on the bed, holding his head in pain and dry heaving. And he was given some Zofran for nausea and Motrin for pain through his IV. And then at 11.30 a.m., Garnet started having this explosive diarrhea. So tell us a little bit about that. That's how he's getting rid of this. His body's getting rid of the sodium, right? Well, if we're figuring that she gave him... A bolus of sodium chloride salt in his G tube at that time. I mean, that's going to induce diarrhea. Okay. Because it's kind of what's called an osmotic force. And it's going to put. It's bringing water into it's the bowel. Bringing water into the bowel, and it's going to give you loose, runny stools. So around noon, Garnet's whole body was trembling, and his glucose was checked, and it was 240. No, that's very high for a glucose. It is. What would cause that? Well, maybe she put some sugar in with the salt. I don't know. But 240 is way too high. So his blood was drawn at 120, and Lacey posted a photo of him on Facebook asking for prayers. At 2.30, Garnet's lab results were back. His sodium was normal, but his chloride was slightly elevated. So at 4.19 p.m., the video EEG caught Lacey taking Garnet back to the bathroom, and he was alert. And when they returned from the bathroom, his head was down. He was kind of floppy. And then at 4.30, Lacey pressed the nurse call button again. This this is where she gave him... Even more. The, the final dose. 
So over the next hour, Garnet's condition was deteriorating rapidly, and just before 5 p.m., Garnet had a grand mal seizure, which is a, a big full-blown seizure. A, a major seizure. All body parts going. And Lacey was screaming on the bed, so maybe she was even a little surprised by that. And Garnet was giving, given some anti-seizure medication, and he went into respiratory distress, and he had to be intubated again. So while doctors were working to save Garnet, Lacey was posting on Facebook and asking for prayers for Garnet. And then at 6.50 p.m. Yeah, now, wait a minute. Just just to beg the question, but isn't that inappropriate? Here, here's your yeah, kid of course who's it is. Of course critically it is. ill, danger of dying, and you're posting pictures on Facebook. Yuck. It is yucky. At 6.50 p.m., Lacey asked about Garnet's labs, and a few minutes later, blood was drawn to check his labs again, and they did a metabolic panel. And at 7.13 p.m., the results came in. Now, his sodium had risen from 144 to 182, and his chloride went from 114 to 160 within four hours. And there was no medical explanation for these elevated levels of sodium and chloride. Well, there is that it was introduced to him. I mean, there's no other way a sodium can go up 40 points in four hours and the chloride going up also with without poisoning going on. This kid was given sodium chloride. He was given salt. Yeah. No, there's, there's no other explanation. So at this point, they're more so, than suspicious. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, and they've also realized we can't take care of this kid here. He needs to go to a big medical center. So they, they call, and they're going to airlift him to the Westchester Medical Center. So they they called over from the referring hospital and said, blah, 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 we're going to re- send, send him kid. over. Yep. And he's got a sodium of 182, and there was disbelief on the other end. They said, that's impossible. Yeah, they actually retested, didn't you they? you got to retest. Yeah. Because it can't be that high. Right. But it was. So he was airlifted to the tertiary care center, and they wanted Lacey to ride with them in the helicopter, and she didn't want to. She said she was afraid of flying or something. Well, and some of her friends convinced her that she needed to go with him. So she did go with him. She did, but not before typing a message to her Facebook friends, pray for Garnett. He's on life support and being life flighted. Again, not something to be doing with your child critically ill. Not a normal person, no. So they get to Westchester. Garnett's in the pediatric intensive care unit. And he was being mechanically ventilated because he couldn't breathe on his own. That's scary stuff. It is. And his labs had improved minimally. He still had a terribly high sodium, 178. His chloride was 147. And as soon as the doctor there in the referring hospital saw him and saw the G-tube, they suspected Lacey. And He couldn't again, figure out how it could be that high, but he saw the G-tube, and that's like an aha moment. It can't be that high. You can't. Without there's, there's introducing no it. No fucking way. Excuse me. There's no way. A sodium goes from normal to 40 points above normal in four hours without salt being introduced to the kid. Absolutely no way. And that's why I wonder why they didn't separate her from him at that point. She, they kept letting her be in the room with him, which I think was a big mistake. So he was made NPO, which means nothing by mouth, and he was given IV fluids to gradually lower his sodium levels. And Lacey was told not to give Garnet anything to drink because it could kill him. Right. So they're still trusting her, which I don't know why. That's that's not smart. So at 11.25 p.m., Lacey took a picture of Garnet. He was intubated and unconscious. And she posted this picture on Facebook. So beneath that, she wrote, Garnet is stable on life support. Please pray for him. My response to that is, fuck you, Lacey. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's just bullshit. I'm sorry. Well, no, again, she's she's just, she's mentally ill. Yes, but in a selfish, horrible way that's not okay. Absolutely horrible. Right? But she's getting some validation by posting this because people are going to be sympathizing with her. Yeah, and these friends are just feeding it, but then 
There was a story of one woman that was a friend of hers who told her husband about it and showed him the pictures, and he's like, that's not right. You don't do that. So there's someone with sense. Good for him. Yeah, and if, some, if people had just ignored her, it might have helped. Well, that goes back years. Yeah, but anyway, the next day was Monday, and Lacey continued to update her Facebook friends. And at 7.20 a.m., Garnet's sodium was 172, and by early afternoon, he started to wake up a little bit. So when the doctor told Lacey this good news that they're going to extubate him, you know, take the breathing tube out so he can breathe on his own, on his own, she said no. She didn't want him to be uncomfortable. Let's just leave it in. Well, of course they didn't listen. Well, why would they? <laughs> but still, but I still. mean, that's, that's such a bizarre request. Yeah, she's totally inappropriate in so many yeah. ways. Yeah. And I think she should have been removed. from. She shouldn't have been allowed near him. But at 3.30 in the afternoon, the tube was removed. He's breathing on his own. The sedatives are wearing off. And he's talking. So he is alert, oriented, maybe a little lethargic. But he's saying that he wants to go home. Yeah. So he's you know getting better. Why? Well, no, he's not getting better. No? No. I mean... He's in the process of herniating his brain because he's got cer cerebral edema. <clears throat> yeah, but don't you think she added water to that and made it worse and killed him? No. Because they I said mean, they found a water bottle I, under the bed later. They did. They found water. So she, you think the salt killed him. You don't and, think that she added water. She, well, I think she probably get, did give him some more fluids. Yeah. But it wasn't going to make any difference at that point. So you think it was too far gone already? I think he was already in the process of herniating his brain. Wow. Which is going to be disastrous because what happens when you herniate is the brain stem, which controls your vital functions, goes down through the hole in the base of the skull. Ooh. Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah. And that shuts down respiratory drive and cardiac drive. So what happens is you herniate and you don't breathe and eventually your heart doesn't beat and you're basically brain dead. And that's what happened to this kid. Wow. So I don't think the additional fluid she might have given him, say, say she gave him eight ounces of Poland spring water or something, Yeah. didn't cause the herniation that was already a preordained Problem. Well, I think the doctors thought it increased the swelling. No? Maybe a little bit. Yeah. But it was. But you don't think it was retrievable before then? No. Okay. Well, at 717, his sodium was down to 161. And at 730, Lacey went on Facebook and posted a new picture of Garnet. And she said, keep the prayers coming. And then at midnight, the pediatric neurologist visited Garnet, and he had a normal exam. And then Tuesday morning, his sodium was 146, and he was stable. So at 7.15 a.m., Lacey sent an instant message saying Garnett had had a hard night, but the nurses thought that he had been restful. And around 7.30 a.m., a code bell sounded. So this is the real beginning of the end here. And this code bell signaled an emergency in Garnett's room. So Dr. Goldsman ran to the room, and Lacey was leaning over Garnet. And he saw the empty Poland Springs water bottle under the bed. He told the nurse to grab it. Now the doctor wondered if Lacey had given Garnet water, which would cause the irreversible brain damage. And he ordered Lacey out of the room. Finally, he should have done that a long time ago. <laughs> For sure. Now Garnet had but stopped it, breathing it, again it and was put on life support. at that point. Okay. You think it was going to happen anyway? It was going to happen anyway. Okay. But still, she shouldn't have been allowed with him. No. So a brain scan at 10.30 a.m. revealed that Garnet was brain dead, and the high concentration of salt in his body had shifted water into his brain cells, causing them to swell. Now this led to a buildup of pressure in the intracranial cavity, and his brain expanded. It had nowhere to go in his skull, and this is when the um, it started herniating as it pushed downward. Like you said, that crushed the centers that control respiration and blood pressure. Exactly. And that, whether she gave him extra fluids orally or not, that wasn't what caused That was the in the process. No. But she did it. Yes. Absolutely. She, she absolutely did it. So when Lacey was told that Garnet wouldn't survive, she lay on the floor and cried. 
Dr. Goldsman called the New York State Child Abuse Hotline and reported his suspicions that Lacey had killed her son. And almost a dozen specialists were called in to make sure that there was no medical explanation for Garnett's hypernatremia. And after confirming, Lacey was notified that there was going to be an investigation. So after Lacey heard that there was going to be an investigation, she called a friend at the fellowship, Valerie Prachet, and she asked her to remove a gastric feeding bag with white liquid in it from her apartment and get rid of it. So Valerie just felt really sad. She loved Garnett. He was like a grandson to her. And she wanted to help Lacey out. So she didn't really think about it. She went to do it. But then as she's thinking more as she's going to do it, she's thinking, well, is this something I really want to do? So she brought a friend with her and she decided to keep the bag. So she put it in a garbage bag and put it in her closet. And later on, she did tell the fellowship executives about it. And it, it did end up going to the police. So this bag, along with one in Lacey's trash that the police went back and got, were found to have very high concentrations of salt. I think one had like 16 salt packets. I don't know how much is in a salt packet, a gram? A huge sure. amount of salt. But, you know, that's circumstantial stuff. And I know the argument was that it was the chain of command got sure. broken. Right. And anybody could have done that. But, but who see, else would do that? Who else would do that? And you still get back to the fact that the kid's sodium level went up 40 points in four hours. There's no way that happens. But this is this is um, big evidence that yeah. they find these bags with salty stuff yeah. in Yeah, so I'm gonna, be I'm gonna believe even despite the defense attorney's assertions that that's what she was doing. Yes. So Lacey was convicted of second degree murder. I'm not going to comment on That's that. That's the summary. I'll just go right to that. I would have convicted her of first-degree murder. Yeah, well, even the second-degree murder was not based on the fact that she was wanting to kill him. It was based on her having reckless disregard for his life. <laughs> okay. So I, it's sometimes questionable. Sometimes I never understand the legal system. So you think she was actually trying to get rid of him because he was getting older and he was going to tell? I think so. I think that's questionable. I mean, it's a, it's quite possible, yeah. I, I think he was starting to recognize that his mommy was hurting him. And I think there were some instances where he was calling for help. I agree with that. But then if she loses him, she loses her whole avenue to sympathy and attention, too. So well, she she might have just been trying to make him does. sick. For a while she does. Yeah. I mean, she loses him and she gets all the sympathy because he died. So she's got to... A gap period where she can have another kid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a cynical representation. No, I mean, it's, it's realistic. I think if she had gotten away with it, she would have had another child pretty quickly. Oh, absolutely. And repeated the same process. Absolutely. But I, I do think the jury did the right thing because she did show reckless disregard. I don't think we can really prove that she wanted him dead, but she absolutely showed disregard for his life. Yeah, I so think, I agree with that. I think you're splitting hairs, but so you would have you think it should be first degree murder? Yes. Okay. But she was convicted anyway. Now the maximum sentence she could have gotten was 25 years to life, and the judge said that he did um, give her some mercy because he thought she was mentally ill with Munchausen by proxy, and he gave her 20 years to life. Which okay. he could have given her 15, so he kind of went the moderate route. Yeah, but he didn't go the light route. No, no. No, he was, he said he was horrified by what she did. <laughs> it I, was cruel, and I mean, the kids suffered. Oh. The kids suffered so this, much. This poor baby suffered from almost day one. Yeah. Of his what life. What a miserable life. And, and she did all these things. I just, God. Yeah. So that is definitely cruel. It is. So Lacey um, is in maximum security Bedford Hills Correctional Facility in upstate New York. She is eligible for parole in 2034. Now, as soon as the sentencing occurred, her attorneys said they were going to appeal, but no appeals have, have been granted. I don't know what they put in for an appeal. I don't think. They did say they might try and sue the hospital as well, but I think that's ridiculous. 
Yes. And yes. I, I don't see any avenues for appeal. Yeah. I mean, obviously you're the attorney, so you're going to say we're going to appeal the verdict, but there's nothing to appeal. A big issue with this for me is the, the doctors, the people in her life. So there were so many red flags, and I know that much of it was reported, but I think they gave her way too much leeway, and I think that she should have been, I think we should be more suspicious and more careful on this. You know, you're a pediatrician. What's your experience? Have you met moms like this? What's the deal with that? I have. You have? I've had a couple times, but before I talk about that, it's, it's difficult. I mean, you never want to suspect a caregiver to being abusive. Well, and some of the doctors said, well, I suspected, but I didn't know. Well, you don't need to know. You only need to suspect. Well, you don't, right. And and the whole thing is if, if you suspect something, you should report it because you're not, not going to get penalized for doing that. But, I mean, it's it's a tough call. Yeah, but this is such an extreme case. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've had in 40 years, almost 40 years of pediatrics, I've had two cases that I recognized. One was easy. It was uh, back when I was an intern resident, so that's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Right? And a, a mom brought her kid in because he kept having periods of unresponsiveness. Now, how old? He was, at that time, about six months old. And so we, at that time, this is a long time ago, we admitted all these kids. And we called them near-miss sudden infant death syndromes because they, they would go unresponsive. The heart rate and color and everything would change. And that does happen. It does happen. Right. And they've evolved into being called from near-miss SIDS to apparent life-threatening events, ALTEs, and now the terminology is BRUE, which is a brief resolved unexplained event. But anyway, it comes down to the child kind of passes out, maybe changes color, and then comes back. Okay. So this first kid was observed and couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, until a nurse walked in, and the baby was in a private room. The nurse walked in and found the mother trying to smother the baby. Oh, my God. Yeah. So what'd she do? She put a pillow over the kid's face. <gasps> wow, what'd the nurse do? The nurse stopped her. Well, good, yeah. yeah. But <laughs> So what do you do with that? So we, they called the police. They Good. came in, they arrested the mother. And wow. She turned out to have a long psychiatric history, and that was that. Well, that's a, that's an obvious one. That was an easy one. Yeah. The, the tougher one was about 20 years ago that I saw a new patient, and this it's, gets back to people doctor shopping, so you don't have to say the same story to all these people. Yeah, that's a big red flag. Right. So I saw this kid who was similar to Garnet, failure to thrive, had a G-tube, and I'm taking the history, and there's just so many red flags. How old was this kid when you saw him? He was three. Okay. And he had a G-tube. This this was in New Hampshire. They had moved to New Hampshire because they had seen a bunch of doctors and nothing was helping him, and he had a G-tube, and he was failure to thrive, and he couldn't take anything orally. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. And it just, the the history wasn't consistent with what was going on. So I ended up calling protective services, and I ended up testifying in court. Wow. Against this person. So and, what was she doing? Well, she was not feeding the baby appropriately, the child. I should say baby, he wasn't a baby anymore, but... Her feeding practices were suspect. And And did she seem like she was really trying to get attention? Yeah. Did she know a lot of medical terminology? She was was very familiar. I mean, she knew almost as much about medicine as I do. (laughs) Well, I doubt it, but... So I, I was suspicious. I called protective services, and the child was eventually removed from home. Wow. 
So those are my experiences twice okay. twice in 40 years. But I bet you've seen some milder things that are a little bit like... Well, yeah, but little... certainly nothing you would call either way. Well, this was a great discussion. I'm glad we did this case. This was a fascinating case. It's yeah. just, I mean, the, the medical aspects, but still, I, I'm overwhelmed by how much chutzpah this woman had that she figured she could get away with poisoning her kid. Well, she did get away with a lot. That's the scary part of it. it and is this was just for, recently. For years. And I think you're right. I think she decided at the end, because this is why I think she should have been tried for first-degree murder. I, yeah. I think she figured out that her child was going to rat her out, and she needed to do something. Well, she was losing control of him. He wasn't yeah. the baby that she could manipulate. Nope. Because he seemed to be a really outgoing, charming little boy. That's yeah, from from all reports, this was a cool kid. A cool kid. They called him, in the fellowship, they called him the mayor. Because he would greet people when they came, and he would ask adults, you know, well, how's your dad? Did you do yeah. this? Very precocious. No, he was he was an amazing kid so from what I've read and heard about. A beautiful, smart kid, yeah. 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 So, so sad. I would have gone after her, but that's beside the point. Oh, I could just kill her. Yeah. I could. Yep. And I'm nonviolent. <laughs> <laughs> I could kill her. Yeah, that's horrible. I mean, part of me feels sorry that I know she's mentally ill, but fuck that. I mean, when you get to that point of hurting a little kid like that, I don't care if you're sick. It just pisses me off. Well, yeah. I yeah. mean, it's just horrible. It is horrible. And one thing the judge said when he sentenced her is he hopes the one good thing that comes out of this is that people are more aware. And I think that that's true. I hope that I hope that physicians and social workers and child care providers and teachers are all a little more aware. Well, yeah. I, I feel like I, I definitely it, am after doing this research. It comes down to if, if you're given a history that doesn't sound appropriate right. for what you're looking at, sure. you've got to be suspicious. Definitely. Absolutely. You can't take the mom's word for it. No. Nope. No. Nope. All right. Well, thanks, Tiki. Great discussion. It was. Thank yeah. you, Julie. Sure. <laughs> So please continue listening to True Crime Brewer. We, we are available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Google Play, and now on iHeartRadio. And please like us on Facebook. And Dickie wants to talk a little bit about his contest, which we haven't had a lot of people. So please call in with your beer reviews. You've got about a month left. This is a plea. <laughs> yeah. we've, we've gotten a few. I was expecting to be overwhelmed by beer reviews. And people I, are shy, but I don't be shy. Been. I guess you guys are shy. Yeah. So anyway, give me a verbal spoken word review of a beer on the voicemail link at tigerever.com, or you can do audio file on your computer or smartphone. Preferably an MP3, but not necessarily. Right. Whatever you can do. Attach it to your email. Send it to True, True Crime Brewery. True Crime Brewery at tigerever.com. So get them in. I want some beer reviews. I need a few more. Because otherwise, I'm going to choose between like three of people. <laughs> so get well, them in. Whatever works. But I would like to get some more. Well, thanks for listening. And we'll be back next week with another episode. Thanks. Bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs>